Good evening, everybody. Yeah, uh, we're going to have a conversation tonight. How many of you came out to hear about Daniel? Well, you're going to have to come back. Because there's, there's something more important to talk about this evening. And uh, what might that be? I'm sorry? <laughs> that's, that's a concern, but that's not, what, that's not what's so important right now. Shavuot. Shavuot. Started last night at sundown. It will end uh, sundown Thursday in Israel. Shavuot, very significant feast. It's one of the three pilgrim feasts where every male had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem if they were in a certain distance from Jerusalem. What were the other two? Pesach, Passover, and Sukkot, Tabernacles. Tabernacles. Those are the three major pilgrim feasts of Israel. Now, the, the first and the last, Pesach and Sukkot, uh, very well known, uh, emphasized quite a bit, but this middle feast, which is also a pilgrim feast, required every male show up. Uh, it's not so, is it? No. And I'm going to pick your brain on how much you know about it, and then we're going to take a look at it. And it, all, it speaks of first two events that had taken place where God is giving to his people. The first time he gives the law. Thank you. The second time he gives the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Boy, if there's ever a time that the church needs an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's now, isn't it? Maybe some of you heard about Tony Evans pastor for 48 years. Uh, his board forced him to resign because of a sin issue. 48 years. By the grace of God. There go any one of us. But you've got to keep yourself in his hands. Keep yourself yielded to the Holy Spirit. And you won't be able to do those kinds of things. You know, how shocking it was when we found out about Ravi Zacharias after he died. What a shock that was. And I have shared with you numerous times inside everybody you know is somebody you don't know. And that's a, more of a serious problem today than ever before because of the lack of true accountability. There really isn't very much accountability anymore in the body of Christ because most people, they just come in, and they go out, and they come in, and they go out, and there's really no developing of a relationship. There's no serious koinonia or communion that takes place. And, and therefore, there's not many. You know, you're fortunate if you have two or three people that you can really share your heart with and some of your struggles. Yeah. I'm thankful for the men and for my wife that I have in my life that I can, I can share anything. Whatever I'm struggling with, whatever I'm dealing with, and ask for prayer. But uh, <clears throat> we should never feel like we're alone in our communion with the Lord. I'm sorry? I, I couldn't find the other one, so I picked this one up. <laughs> but I like this one, yeah. This is a nice change, you know. Uh, where was I? We should never be alone. We should never isolate. We need to always look to have communion, koinonia with people who love us and we can trust with anything. And they'll pray for us, encourage us, hold us accountable. But today that's a, that's a rare thing that takes place, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Gail, would you stand up? <laughs> would everybody stand up and say hi to Juan and Mercedes? Hello, Juan and Mercedes, we love you. Hola. Chachi, hola. We miss you. And Dana, hi, Dana. <clears throat> uh, at the end of the service, I'm going to take a survey. Survey says, listen to me. At the end of the service, I'm going to take a survey. You're here, and so we're going to vote. Survey says, how many of you want to stop Wednesdays for the summer and pick it up again in September? How many want to continue on? Don't answer now at the end of the service, okay? Uh, 
you know, I don't want to have you come out if you don't feel like coming out. And uh, maybe it'll, uh, if we take a break for the summer and start up again in September, it'll encourage more people to come out. Maybe uh, we need to continue coming out no matter how few of us gather together. Okay, well, I'll give you a chance to vote at the end. <laughs> it's going to be a conversation tonight. Yeah. You know what we're talking about tonight? No. No. She va vu ot. Sheva ot. Sheva ot. Pentecost. It's today. It's, it's happening right now. And what I started saying is that if we ever, if there was ever a need for a pouring out of the Holy Spirit in our day and time, it's now. Yeah. It really is now. You know, there's lots of concerning things taking place in the world, and, and that's okay. I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is that I am everything he wants me to be, and that he'll finish the work he started in me, just as Jonathan led us in song tonight. That should be our primary concern, singularly, individually, our relationship with him. And is the world really seeing Jesus through my life? Or am I just like my unsaved neighbors or family or friends? Except where I go on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning occasionally. Hmm. That's a concern, right? And if, if men like uh, Tony Evans and Ravi Zacharias, and there's too many to even mention, we can go down the list of failures. And, and why did those failures occur? Why did they occur? Why? No accountability. No transparency. Do you, do you know how lonely it is? Even, even pastoring a small church as I do here, do you know how lonely it is pastoring? But you need to seek out relationships that are genuine, that hold you accountable, so there's not much disparity between the man on the outside and the man on the inside. And the one who has to hold me accountable to that more than anyone is that woman there. Right? So we're going to talk about Shavuot, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, and then we're going to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives right now, those over the internet, and those in our communion, in our state, our country, in the world. It's crazy out there, isn't it? It's crazy, the things that are happening. Good evening, Leonardo. Come here, little buddy. I'm going to put you on the spot. Huh? He showed you where the book of Daniel was? He wasn't yeah, sure he wasn't sure you knew? Yeah, You're a big help, aren't you? Yeah. Do you know anything about Pentecost? No, not really. Not really. Okay. But we're gonna teach you tonight, okay? All right, now don't fall asleep back there, okay? And I'm gonna teach you because we want the Holy Spirit to come upon you in such a powerful way, enter into your heart and change your life for ever. Ever. Yeah. ever. <laughs> yeah. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for uh, discernment and uh, for discretion, Lord, because there's so many things stirring in my head and my heart. I don't want to say anything I shouldn't say. Uh, I want to say what I should say. So, Lord, take control of my thoughts, my words. My action, my demeanor, everything, Lord. These are your people, Lord. This is your church, your body, Lord. And I would ask that tonight that your Holy Spirit would show up in such a wonderful way as the gentleman that he is, to minister to our hearts, minister to our lives, Lord. Lord, truly, truly, we came in one way. Oh, God, please, may we exit another, every single one of us, Lord, for your glory. Be glorified, Jesus. Be glorified in our lives more than ever before. In Jesus' holy and precious name. And everyone said, Amen. I mean, okay, Leviticus chapter 23. Let's start there. 
Leviticus 23 is where we have the direction or instruction with regarding the seven major feasts of Israel, three in the spring of the year, one in the summer, and three in the fall. Every one of it, every one of them have something to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ and his work within his called out assembly, Jews and Gentiles. Every one of them are describing or memorializing something God has done in the past on behalf of his people Israel. I was talking with someone this week, and they were asking me, why Why doesn't God do the kinds of miracles he did in the past? Because we have the miracle of his word, and we have the miracle of the transferring power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And never before has God worked so powerfully and so miraculously on behalf of a people as he did with Israel, taking them and bringing them out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt. But when that took place, he gave him this, them the seven appointments or feasts of the Lord, these modim, these uh, times that they were to be remembered. The first one was Pesach, Passover, and that, was, that occurred when they were coming out of Egypt, when God instructed Moses that they were each, each family was to take a lamb. And when did they do that? The tenth day, the tenth day of Nizan, they were to select a lamb. Is there a clip on here? Yeah, praise the Lord. This thing keeps falling back, excuse me. Okay. See, I'm not head and shoulders, the neck swivels. <laughs> My favorite shampoo, head and shoulders. <laughs> the tenth day of Nizan, they were to select a lamb. On the 14th day, they were to kill the lamb, the lamb, right? And at twilight, they killed it. As, as you would read the text, you would discover it's talking about a lamb singular. So we know that all of that was anticipatory of the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world on Passover, not, not Easter. <laughs> not Easter. Nonetheless, so that occurred. That actual historical event was the first Passover. And God told them they would commemorate that. And it would also be anticipatory of something that he would do in himself when he would redeem the world through the blood of his son, through the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The next feast after Pesach, in that spring of the year, they're all lumped together as a seven-day festival, was unleavened bread. Unleavened bread spoke of the removal of sin from their lives. Removal of sin. Leaven corrupts by puffing up. What puffs up? Pride. 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 We need to constantly try to ask God to give us an attitude of humility, meekness, right? Not uh, seeing little of yourself, but just seeing a little less of yourself, okay? And more of others and more of God, right? Uh, but nonetheless, leaven puffs up, and leaven was a type of sin. And behind every sin is pride, right? We think we know better. Mm -hmm. And then the next feast, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was first fruits. Now, the, the Pesach was on a specific day of the year. When? It was the month of Nizan. And what particular day was Passover? The 14th, 14th. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread was on a very specific day. And when was that? The 15th. The 15th of Nizan was Unleavened Bread. The Feast of First Fruits, First Fruits, however, was not on a specific day of the month. But it's described differently. How was it described? No, no, no. You're, on, you're, on, you're, on, you're going way out. You're on Pentecost already. I'm just talking about the Feast of First Fruits. No, the first day after the normal Saturday Sabbath. Yes. So the Feast of First Fruits was to be celebrated in the spring of the year. You have three feasts lumped together. We call it Pesach or Passover, but it's really Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Those are three feasts that celebrate in the spring of the year. Passover is always on the 14th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is always on the 15th. But the Feast of First Fruits was always celebrated, listen to me now, the day after the normal Saturday Sabbath immediately following Passover. So in the year in which Jesus was crucified, okay, 
That Sunday morning was what day of the month? The 17th day of Nisan. Now, it doesn't always fall on the 17th day of Nisan, but in the year in which Jesus was crucified, it fell on the 17th day of Nisan. How coincidental. <laughs> because that's the exact day that the ark rested. That's the exact day that the Jews crossed over on dry ground, the Red Sea, beside themselves, out of their mind with joy, right? The 17th day of Nisan, a new beginning for Noah and his family and a new beginning for Israel coming out of the bondage. But more importantly, a new beginning for everyone who would surrender to the Lamb of God, making him their Lord and Savior. He is the Lord Jesus, the Christ. Where he is not Lord, he's not Savior. Everybody wants the Savior. I don't see with a whole lot of people that want to sign up and make him Lord. But what does it mean to make him Lord? To be completely obedient to his will, totally surrendered. And that can only be accomplished through the person of the Holy Spirit working within and through us, right? Okay. Now, we have this feast that we're going to be talking about tonight. If you look at Leviticus 23, if we begin... In verse 15, and after you count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheave of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Okay, what's the sheave of the wave offering? What are they waving? What? Barley. This is the spring of the year. Spring of the year. They didn't have any wheat harvest yet. That's what Pentecost is, the wheat harvest. And, then, and that's anticipatory of the great harvest in the fall of the year, tabernacles, right? But in the spring of the year, it was a harvest that they would collect, but it was barley. It was a barley harvest. And, you know, barley's okay, but it's not like wheat, is it? But, but, but barley, you can sustain life with barley, can't you? And they're very thankful for what God gave them. And so they would wave the sheaves of the barley loaves, right, before the Lord, right? And when did they do that? The Feast of First Fruits, when was that? Immediately following the Saturday Sabbath, immediately after Passover. That's always the Feast of First Fruits. So if we're going to count, now it says we have to count. Look what it says here. Now look at the text, okay? When, when I want to make commentary, I'll ask you to look up. But right now, look down. Verse 15, you shall count for yourself from the day of the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaves of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Seven Sabbaths or seven seven-day periods, which is 49 days, 49 days. And what would the 50th day be? Pentecost or Shavuot. You, you count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Now, what would that be? That would be wheat. That would be the wheat offering, because it's 50 days later, it's in the summer, and the wheat harvest is beginning. You shall bring from your habitations two loaves of two-tenths of an ephod. So you're going to present this grain offering, this wheat offering. It's going to be two loaves of bread, okay? But remember now, the Feast of First Fruits in the spring of the year would occur on the day following the normal Saturday Sabbath after Passover, so it's always a Sunday, and then you're to count seven Sabbaths after that. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, first Sabbath. Then you go Sunday, Monday, etc., second Sabbath, third Sabbath, fourth Sabbath, fifth Sabbath, sixth Sabbath. Ha! And the very next day would be Pentecost. And what day of the week would that be? A Sunday, a Sunday, a Sunday. Now, does Pentecost always fall in? Well, the Jews have different reckonings, you know. You put three Jews together and you'll have at least six opinions, right? <laughs> and, and there is some wide disagreement among Reform and Orthodox Jews as to when you start this countdown, but it's specific right here in the text. If you're talking about a whole, a holy Sabbath, a high holy day of the year, it couldn't possibly come out to 49 days because they didn't happen regularly. They didn't happen weekly. They would happen most often monthly, right? And every new moon. So it has to be that you're counting every normal Sabbath, every Saturday Sabbath after first fruits. So does that make sense to you? And that's how you get to 49 days. You with me now? Anybody confused? If you're confused, please tell me. I want you to understand this. 
Very good. Okay, so back to the text. You shall offer with the bread, excuse me, let's go back to 17, chapter, verse 17, chapter 23. You shall bring from your habitations two loaves of two tenths of an ephod. That's just a, a measure. And they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with, no, this can't be, that's got to be a misprint. Wait a minute, no other grain offering is baked with leaven. Everything was to be unleavened. Why, in this case, are they leavened? Why two loaves? What? Gentiles and Jews, because the fulfillment of this feast, as Luke is going to record, records for us in Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost had fully come, or when the feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, was fulfilled, okay, on that day in Acts chapter 2, it brought together the sake of the assembly of the people of God who were both Jew and Gentile, and they were called the assembly, the ecclesia. They were not called the church. They don't, they're not called the church. They're not even called Christian until when? Yeah. Acts chapter 11. This is chapter 2. Okay? And chapter 10 was, we've already been through chapter 10 on Sunday morning. And what did I say chapter 10 was? The Gentile Pentecost. Because Acts chapter 2 Pentecost was all Jews. And, and that early church was predominantly Jewish. Ten years later, ten years later, Acts chapter 10, right? And you have this Pentecost of the Gentiles, Cornelius and his entire household, and all those people that gathered together, and I'll bet there was 120. <laughs> and the same manifestation of the Holy Spirit occurred then that occurred in Acts chapter 2. Why not 3,000? Why not 3,000? Because there were 120 in the upper room. But Peter's sermon 3,000 They did, but they were Jews. Yeah. yeah. So, so these 120 Gentiles got saved at Cornelius, and shortly after that, 3,000 Gentiles were saved. Up. <laughs> no, we don't know. Speculating, speculating, okay? But nonetheless, two loaves representing one new people. Two loaves, both Jew, Hebrews, and the Goyam, everybody else, right? And God so loved the world that he gave. And why do they come leavened? What can you do about your sin nature? Nothing. Nothing. Now, Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, in the Orthodox assemblies, is also called the Feast of Revelation. Why is it called the Feast of Revelation? Because it was the day in which Moses was... How do you know that? How do we know that? Go to Exodus chapter 19, maybe? When did the children of Israel leave Egypt? They sacrificed the lamb on the 14th. They left Egypt. They traveled for three days, and they came to the Red Sea on what day? The 17th, and they crossed over on dry land. 17th day of what month? And Nizon would become the first month in the sacred calendar, right? Okay, so now look at chapter 19. In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So we have a marker here for the time frame. We know it's the third month. The first month was Nizan. The second month, Iyar. The third month in which Pentecost falls was Savan. Savan. This is the third month. So it is believed that there is good evidence to support the fact that Moses received the law from God to give to the people of Israel on Pentecost, the third month. It's the third month since they left Egypt. Egypt, they left in the first month of the year, was Nizan. After that, the second month, Ayar, not Ayar, but Sevan. That's the third month. That's why they call it the Feast of Revelation. It's when God gave them the law. And he said, just do it. And they said, all that you said we will do. 
And then the rest of the story, right? Because we know what had taken place, and with the giving of the law, and they broke the law even before they be received it fully. How many died that day? 3,000. With the reception of the law on Pentecost, 3,000 died. With the reception of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. What did you say, Deborah? 3,000 came to life spiritually. Yeah. It's also believed that King David was born on Pentecost. Did you know that? No. And there's this beautiful love story, the greatest romance love story that's ever been told. I wish they would make a movie of this romance. You know, you watch all those Hallmark, Hallmark romance stories, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> don't make me do that again. Please don't make me do that <laughs> Well, yeah. I'd rather watch Black Beauty. <laughs> okay, so where were we? Where were we? Romance. What romance took place during Pentecost? Ruth and Boaz. Oh, it's just a beautiful story, but it has such great symbolism with regard to Christ and his church, right? Boaz is a type of Jesus, the Redeemer. Ruth, the Moabitess, this Gentile, a type of us. The Gentiles who become the bride of Christ. Hmm? Naomi, the type of Israel. Israel. Beautiful, beautiful. All in Pentecost. Isn't that interesting? How that, so here, that's where we get the, the um, evidence and the support for the fact that the law was given on Pentecost. Go back to 23, Leviticus 23. I'm sorry, John, I didn't hear that. The first fruit offering from us is sin. Yeah. You come to him as you are. I love that, that, that when Billy Graham did a crusade, every time he get it, he had a crusade, what was the song that was playing and sung? Just as I am. That you come to God just as you, you can't fix yourself. Everybody needs fixing. Is that true? Yeah. Everybody needs fixing. But you can't fix yourself. How, how do you become a godly man or a godly woman? I'm sorry? Surrender to the Lord. It's not your obedience to the word. It's not, well, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read the word of God more. I'm just going to purpose to obey God. That's just trying to keep the law. Can you keep the law? With the reception of the law, bring, the law brings forth death. You can't possibly keep the law. You can't be a godly man or woman by your own efforts. And I don't care how moral. You know, there's some wonderful moral people who are Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, atheists, but they're such giving people, such moral people, such good people, but not in comparison to the righteousness and the purity of God. No one can compare. Even Mary herself needed a Savior, right? She sang her Magnifica. But the only way you can be a godly man or a godly woman is continually surrendering to the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes us holy. Right? As I've shared with you before, this, this constant battle that we have for 2,000 years now, is it God's sovereignty or is it man's free will? Did you save yourself or did God choose you? You know, and you can battle that out all you want, and you can argue the scriptures either way. Just, just get comfortable in what you believe. But let me tell you, I am so convinced that I have nothing to do with my justification or my glorification, but I have everything to do with my sanctification. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit, but you have to submit. You have to surrender. You don't surrender in justification. God does that for you. You don't surrender in glorification. God's going to do that for us. But you must surrender to understand, experience, and demonstrate the sanctification God wants to bring in your life. And that's not through the law. It's through a love relationship. You surrender to him as a woman surrenders to her husband because of love's sake. Right? Because he has more in mind for me than I have for myself. How could I not surrender to him? Pentecost 
is where God gives the human race, those who would believe in him, the ability to be godly. You're not going to be godly by your outward behaviors. You're not going to be godly by the dress code. You're not going to be godly by the way you wear your hair. You're not going to be godly by your diet. <laughs> no, I know. I know. I'm just teasing you. You know, but some people think they're more spiritual because they're vegan. I pity you. You're not even happy. <laughs> no. But some people, you know, you, you, Bob Jones University, when I first came down here, oh boy, they've changed a lot since I've been here. But it used to be so legalistic in trying to appear outwardly righteous or godly. But you're not, you've got to clean the house on the inside. And if you don't clean it on the inside, eventually it's going to show itself on the outside. I.e., Ravi Zacharias, Tony Evans, how many more? You shall offer the bread, seven lamb, with the bread, seven lambs of the first year, without blemish, one bull, two rams, and they shall be as a burnt offering unto the Lord, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma unto the Lord. Verse 19, then you shall sacrifice one kid, not children, not children, this is a goat, one kid of the goats, although you'd like to sacrifice some of these little monsters, I know you, but one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of the peace offering. Whose problem is it when they're a little monster? It's a parent's problem. Oh, boy. You know, I'd have a parenting class, but I think we lose half the church. <laughs> no, I do. I really do, you know, because they, they know it all. And, oh, boy, we produce these little... Mm. Nobody believes in discipline anymore, do they? Huh? I didn't get all the... My father, well, what we call them, shellacans. You know shellacan? Mm. I didn't get all the shellacans I deserved or should have gotten, but I got a lot. And my boy, I spanked that boy. I think I spanked him every single day till he was about 12 years old. He was so strong-willed. Oof. They wanted to put him on Ritalin and this, that, and I'll take care of this boy, don't you? I'll tire him out. I'll wear him out. <laughs> uh, but it, your will to train them needs to be far greater than their will to disobey. But we don't have that today. Five minutes, just five minutes. Well, five minutes more. Five minutes. No, I, I'm done. I, I told you. Threatening, repeating parents. Is that what God does? Does God do that? No, no. What does God expect? First time obedience. When I speak, you do, right? There's no but, 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 you know. And you can't say not so, Lord. No, 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 no. <laughs> but that's that's why we. That's what we have, the fruit we have produced through all of this nonsense in parenting is what we're seeing in all these college campuses and all these protests. Did you, did you see this week how uh, they were protesting in Washington and that one um, ranger, park ranger, was being pelted by them and trying to protect the statue? Well, this is in Washington, D.C. This is a, a monument in Washington. He's trying to protect, okay? And where are the police? The Washington, D.C. police. And where's the police chief? Where was she? Marching in a gay pride parade, high-fiving and celebrating with all these perverted persons. That's what the Bible calls them. When you read your Old Testament, and it says, and God destroyed all the perverted persons in the land? Well, that's what he's talking about. The transgender, right? The lesbians, the homosexuals. It used to be a mental illness, you know. We used to, used to qualify that as a mental illness. What is it today? It's a chosen lifestyle. We were born that way. You were born a sinner. I agree. I agree. You know, crazy. Anyway, why did I get off on that? We're doing. Lord, I asked you to help me to give me discretion tonight, Lord. Verse 19. Okay. Then you shall sacrifice the kids. The kid of the goats is a sinner for two men of the first year sacrifice. It's a peace offering. The burnt offering, the sin offering, the peace offering. You understand how that works, right? The, what's the burnt offering? 
where you offer everything you are to God. Consume me, Lord, for your purposes. Take my life, take all that I am and all that I have, all that I will ever be, all that I will ever have. Take it, Lord, and use it for your glory. That's the burnt offering. And then you offer the sin offering. Then you say, now, Lord, forgive me. Right? Mea culpa, mea culpa. Forgive me, Lord, for what I am. Not for what I've done. What I am is determined what I do. Lord, change me. Change me from the inside out, Lord. Change me at the very core of who I am. And then once you really surrender to him, he will begin to make that wonderful transformation in your life. You will not be the same person. And then you have peace with God, peace of God, peace in God. That's the peace of fellowship of and the communion with the Lord. Listen, that is more valuable than anything else this world will ever offer you or anyone in this world would ever offer you is peace with God. Truly entering into that communion with the Lord. Then there's a little phrase I always say. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I care what he knows about me. That's far more important. And, and I've taught my, my beloved, don't worry about what anybody thinks about you. That doesn't matter. Who cares what anybody thinks about you? What does God know about you? That's what's most important. And if you would consider that each and every day, you wouldn't fall into those sins those secret sins that you hide in the shadows that God will bring to light because he loves you too much, right? He did it for David, sending Nathan, the prophet, the type of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Burnt offering, sin offering, peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs, and they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. Everybody gathered together. That's where we're gathered together tonight. Hmm? Shevot. You shall do no customary work on it. Oh, I like that. You like that? Anybody work today? I'm sorry, I work today. It shall be a statute forever in all of your dwellings throughout all your generations. Now, the three pilgrim feasts, as I said, they emphasize Pesach a lot. They emphasize Sukkot, but they don't place enough emphasis upon Shavuot or on the Feast of Weeks, Feast of Revelation. Uh, Shavuot means... Shavuot means... Very good, very good. Pentecost is the Greek meaning... Right, 50. So forget the Greek and stay focused on the Hebrew, Shavuot, seven. Seven weeks they were to count, right? Hmm. And how long are we going to celebrate this feast? Forever. Who called it Pentecost? The Jews? Who named it Pentecost? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Just like they named Passover, Easter. Just like they named Tabernacles, Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm sorry? Only here, only here, yeah. You know, as, as true believers in Jesus the Messiah, we should emphasize these feasts and talk about them with other believers so they have some awareness of it. Uh, Tom, you, you were fortunate enough in your discipleship to be introduced to uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very good in eschatology. Very good, very good. Uh, Arnold is 80 years old now? Just about, yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But if you want to uh, read an excellent volume, uh, Israelology, The Missing Link in Systematic Theology by Arnold Fruchtenbaum, it's only a thousand pages. But, but you, can, you can, and I've taught through it a couple times. I don't know if I should do it again sometime, but the first three quarters of the text is all about the reason why covenant theology is responsible for passive and aggressive anti-Semitism, even the anti-Semitism we see today. But the last quarter of the book deals with dispensationalism, which he is a strong proponent of, which we are as well. And uh, that, if you can't, if you're a dispensationalist, you can't read the word without falling in love with Israel and the Jewish people, you know. Uh, but forever, forever we'll be celebrating these feasts. 
When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. When you reap, nor shall you gather any gleanings from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor, for the stranger, for I am the Lord your God. So there should be this giving. And what did what took place when when Ruth and Naomi came back from Moab? Back into the land, and how did they provide for themselves? By reaping the corners of the field. Ruth would go out and labor in the hot sun, collecting what the reapers would leave behind, and then Boaz said, oh my, just one look. That's all it took. Yeah, just one look. Leave some more for that girl. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Now, what did he like about her? What was so beautiful about her? All he could see of her was that much. You know? But the eyes are the window to the soul. But what did he know about her? This Moabitess was so devoted to her mother-in-law and caring for her and loving her and working so hard for her. And he fell in love with that devotion. And why would he fall in love with that devotion? Why Boaz of all people? This Moabitess. Because his mother was Rahab the harlot. And he remembers how Israel treated his mother, Rahab. And he thought, she's just like my, she reminds me so much of my mother. Hmm? If you had a good mom, you want to marry a woman just like mom, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what that's like. I'm sorry. I just don't. I didn't. It wasn't well with me. <laughs> yeah. uh, so where are we? Now, this first Pentecost, okay, is, is, uh, was anticipatory that God was going to do something wonderful for them. Remember, go back to Exodus 19. You'll see that God was telling Israel, prepare yourself. You're going to meet me on the mountain tomorrow. On the, on the, when the people understood what God was offering them to come in before his presence, and there was thunderings and lightnings and dark clouds, and the mountain moved and trembled, and they said to Moses... You talk to them. We don't want to talk to them. We ain't right. (laughs) You know, that's why a lot of people don't want to come to the Lord. They don't want to come to church. They don't want to talk to you about the Lord because they know they ain't right. Now, the Bible teaches us, especially the Word of God, as Paul writes to young Timothy and says, for the Word of God is given to us to show us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. Hmm? 2 Timothy 3.16. But a lot of people don't want to get right. A lot of people like where they are. And Israel was flirting with all those idols and those idolatrous practices. But God said, I'm going to give you the opportunity to meet with me. No, Moses, you meet with him. And we'll do everything he tells you. Did they? No. No, 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 no. But nonetheless, on Pentecost, God met with Moses and gave the people the law. What would be acceptable morally, ethically, as far as the righteousness and the purity that they had to have, had to acquire in order to come before him? And could any of them? No, never. Feast of first fruits. What happened in the year the Lord was crucified on the Feast of First Fruits? The veil was torn. That's when he was crucified. But that's when he was crucified on Pesach. But on the Feast of First Fruits, the women came to the tomb and the angel said, He ain't here. He is risen. Right? When was that? The Feast of First Fruits. In the week of Passover. So now, what are they supposed to do? That was that Sunday morning, right after the normal Saturday Sabbath, after Passover. Now every Jew was counting seven Sabbaths, right? He was in the grave how long? Three days and three nights, but then he arose. He arose on the Feast of First Fruits. Now, he told them, 
And how long was he seen on earth before he ascended? 40 days. How long before Passover? Before Pentecost? 10 more days. Now, they didn't know that. He just told them. He said, listen, don't leave Jerusalem. They wouldn't come up the mountain. They wouldn't receive the law. Okay? But you wait in Jerusalem, and you receive the Holy Spirit. And he told them. He said, just wait. Wait in Jerusalem. Tarry in there until the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. I want to help you. Be a good boy and a good girl. You see, that's what the pow pow is supposed to do is for parents, right? Well, you don't use the pow pow, you use the pinch. Ow! <laughs> Mrs. McFarlane, my grade school teacher, oh, she used to take my sideburns and she'd pull them out and twist them. Yeah, oh! <sighs> my father told me never to hit a woman, but boy, I was tempted. <laughs> But Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, right, to make us the people he desires us to be. We can't do that. Make me, Lord. Make me, as we say. So we see that Jesus offered the Holy Spirit exactly on the day of Pentecost, 50 days from when he resurrected the Feast of First Fruits. And that first offering, that first wave offering, what was it? A barley loaf. Okay, but that was anticipatory of a greater blessing, a greater harvest that would come later on in the summer on Pentecost, and that offering was what? A weed offering. Now, I, look, you're darn tootin', I want my gluten, okay? I love bread, I'm sorry, I just do. I, I like bread, I like to have a cup of coffee and a nice piece of bread and some good butter. Hmm? Oh boy, what a way to start the day. But that Pentecost wave offering, all of that was anticipatory of what? The, come on. The greater harvest at Tabernacles. <sighs> Think of Thanksgiving and all of the, the produce that comes in at that time of year. Oh, there's no better time to make an apple pie than the fall of the year, right? When the apples are fresh. God, just come off the tree after that first frost. <sighs> Macintosh are the best, and one green, one green apple with a bunch of Macintosh apples makes a good pie. <laughs> Pentecost has occurred. The first harvest. Gentiles, Jews. But it speaks of the greater harvest that's about to come. Tabernacles. The second coming. Just as, as the first three feasts were fulfilled at his first coming, right? Jesus was crucified on Pesach. He dealt with the sin problem on unleavened bread. And he rose again on first fruits. Then he sent the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father that the Holy Spirit would dwell within us and teach us, mentor us, guide us, empower us, right? On Pentecost. And then you have the three fall feasts that are trumpets, Yom Torah, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, right? So you have the Feast of Trumpets, you have the Day of Atonement, which is not a feast, it's a solemn day, and then you have Tabernacles. All of those speak of the second coming of Christ. The first time, now that second coming is in two phases, right? The day of the Lord begins when? The rapture. It ends when? The end of the millennial reign. That's a long day. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day unto the Lord. So the day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. It ends at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But the second coming of the day of the Lord is in two phases. The first time he comes for the church. They will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage as just as in the day of Noah. And then suddenly, right? But then the, sec the, the second phase of that is when he comes with the church. And what's happening on earth then? <sighs> wow, all of the wrath of God is breaking out upon the world. So some people don't understand. They get confused over that. The reason why it can take the whole world unaware as a thief in the night is because the first time it's just for believers to be taken, to be snatched away. In the marriage feast of the Lamb. Hmm? But the second coming... When he comes to judge the earth, to establish his millennial reign, all the world will see it. As lightning flashes from the east into the west, the whole world is going to see his coming. And we're coming with him. Amen? Now, we want to talk about Pentecost. 
we, I don't know about you, I want a fresh outpouring of his spirit in my life. Do you? Do you? Uh, Jonathan, I know you didn't prepare this, and I didn't tell you any of this ahead of time, but uh, maybe you could lead us in, a, in a, just a song or two to prepare our hearts and for us to pray corporately. This is Shavuot right now. I believe God wants to pour out his Holy Spirit right now in our lives. Let's, can we gather together closer as a family? Come on, let's, let's just fill up these first two rows. I'm going to sign out right now because this is just a private time for us. So sayonara, everybody who's online, we love you. We'll see you Sunday. Thank you for listening to this message from Community Chapel of Greenville. For more information and to find more messages like this, please visit to www.ccgreenville.org. It is our desire to see our Lord high and lifted up, and to see His people grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.